Yep. Uh, professor already said that the Russian eagle has two heads, so I guess that's only natural that we now turn to a more traditional Western head. But I would like to first uh, thank uh, the organizers for this wonderful event, yeah, for enriching debates, for the possibility to meet friends and colleagues, and also for the seamless organization. Yeah. So I think it was perfect, so a very deep thank goes uh, to the organizers. I must say that I felt the glory yeah, of participating in the Alexandria conference already in spring when I was first invited to the conference. And when so many people and colleagues and friends started referring to this conference as the conference where I will be speaking. Yeah. So in that sense, yeah, I really appreciated this invitation. I've been like in this glory in the glory of this invitation for nearly six months, I guess. Uh, right, moving to the presentation. Yeah, and um, uh, Vladimir already introduced the presentation and said that it will be challenging. Indeed, it is challenging, yeah. And uh, in fact, many colleagues uh, already on the first day asked me what I was going to talk about because nothing changes or so much has been already said about it. And uh, when we look at uh, Russia's relations with the West and Russia's relations with the European Union in particular, of course, yeah, we are more or less uh, in the pessimistic side of these relations, saying that uh, uh, the relations are bad. And the relations are probably so bad as they've never been before. Yeah? Uh, but I will try to strike a more optimistic note, yeah, because we are asked to think uh, in the 2030 perspective, 2030 perspective, yeah, that's what the organizers asked us to do. And also, I would say that I'm an optimist out of despair, yeah, because the relations are so bad that uh, I think it probably can hardly be worse. Yeah? And therefore, I will try to be optimistic out of this despair. Yeah? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to briefly describe the state of the relations, or to generalize the state of the relations between Russia and the West and Russia and the European Union. Uh, and this will be the shortest part of the presentation because so much has been already said in these walls um, by all the distinguished participants about it. And then I will move to uh, the way forward, yeah. uh, which is more of a research agenda that can be taken, or at least it might be a part of the research agenda. But of course, it's um, a research agenda which has some policy implications. Yeah. And I will be really interested in listening to the critiques and questions that will follow afterwards. Right, yeah. the state of the art. Yeah. So what do we have uh, on the Russian side? Yeah. Well, we all know that we have this protracted feeling of not being integrated into the Western world, into the Western liberal world order. Yeah. That's uh, the feeling that we have in Russia. And uh, when I say Russia, in fact, I do mean Russia, I do mean most of the players, because there is an amazing consensus um, at the time in Russia, as Levada polls, in fact, demonstrate us. Yeah? One of the recent polls, in fact, was um, about sanctions and about what the Russians make out of it. Yeah? And 43% replied that they see it yeah, as a sign that the West treats Russia as a competitor. Yeah. Another 35% said that that means that the West doesn't like Russia. Yeah. And yet another 21% was talking about the West not understanding Russia. Yeah. So there is an amazing consensus along that lines, yeah, which of course defines the foreign policy course of the Russian Federation, which doesn't uh, exclude the fact that of course foreign policy is a substitute for domestic policy in Russia of today, and we see so many Diplomats of Russia become national heroes, yeah? so they are always on TV and basically the foreign policy agenda and how bad the situation is in the West dominates our television and our TV debates. Yeah? And one journalist recently was saying that in fact we don't have any differentiation between foreign policy journalists and Russian policy journalists yeah, because every journalist is a foreign policy journalist at the moment, yeah? just because the domestic policy does not exist. Yeah? One, of course, can uh, ask whether Russia is really sovereign in this particular situation when foreign policy dominates our domestic debates and when domestic debates as such do not exist. Yeah? Uh, or when the yeah, Russian economy really feels the pressure of sanctions despite the fact that uh, the policy, uh, political leaders of Russia, in fact, try to deny that. The related question which was also raised in these walls 
is uh, how presidential elections uh, will affect uh, the situation. Not because we don't predict uh, how the presidential elections will end, but rather because we don't know what the program will be. Yeah, and that's still a mystery. Yeah? So we have only how many? Five months to go before the elections, and it's still a mystery for the majority of us. Yeah? So what about the West? Yeah? For the West, Russia is a problem. Yeah? Russia is a problem because it challenges the liberal world order, yeah? clearly. Uh, and, uh, and we see it uh, in all the public debates about Russia, in all technical debates about Russia, in all experts' debates about Russia. Russia does challenge the norms uh, of the liberal world order. Yeah? And Russia, in fact, dares go quite far, yeah? as far as not many players uh, have dared so far. Russia violated the sovereignty of Ukraine. Yeah, that's of course is uh, pretty much in the picture of yeah, of the West, and that's it is a sub sub substantial part of the agenda uh, of Russian agenda in the West. Yeah, Russia interferes into the internal affairs of countries, uh, and that's basically the debate ranges from the U.S. elections all the way down to the referendum in Catalonia. Some Russian traces were allegedly discussed and identified there as well. Yeah, so basically, Russia is blamed for all the wrong yeah, that happens in the West, and we see it pretty much present in all the public debates. Yeah? And in that sense, uh, yeah, so we basically yeah, fear, uh, see that Russia is dealt as one of the biggest problems in the West. Yeah? Uh, another trend that I would like to pinpoint is the trend about exceptionalism in the sense that Russia is treated with exceptionalism quite frequently. And probably the biggest, uh, the best illustration of that is the question of the Eurasian integration. Yeah? When everybody actually welcomes integration in principle, but once we start talking about Eurasian integration, or Russia-driven Eurasian integration, it becomes a problem. Yeah? Uh, or, yeah, so uh, another illustration is the debate about Nord Stream. Again, yeah, so uh, quite a lot of efforts are put uh, to, in fact, change the interpretation of the EU law in such a way as to make sure that it does apply to the waters, yeah, territorial waters of the European Union, so that Russia, in fact, uh, uh, changes like the course of the pipeline or the strategy of the pipeline is transformed. Yeah? So this exceptionalism is worrying, yeah, to, be fair, uh, to be honest. And uh, even cooperation on shared threats yeah, that Russia is so much fond of yeah, becomes problematic. And of course it is problematic. If you see that Russia is the origin of many threats, how can you possibly cooperate with it? Yeah? How can, can you possibly design any sort of cooperation with Russia? Yeah, Russia hopes yeah, quite a lot uh, to have this cooperation on shared threats, but it doesn't seem to be in the agenda of Western countries at the moment. In that sense, I think there is a vicious circle. There is a mutual reinforcement. Uh, there is a mutually reinforcing vicious circle on the Russian part and on the Western part, yeah, of sort of like mutual suspicion and mutual sort of like inclination not to cooperate. What is more is that uh, Russia and the West are paradigmatically quite similar, yeah, in at least three respects. Yeah. First of all, there is this notion of interference. Yeah. In fact, when I look at the debates in the Western world of today about Russia's interference, it reminds me so much Russian debates that we've had for the number of previous years yeah, when the evil West yeah, was responsible for so many issues. Yeah. So this sort of like scapegoating of external actors is worrying and it's very similar on the Russian side and on the Western side. Secondly, yeah, there is a certain competition for citizens, yeah, for civil societies, uh, with Russia sort of like denying um, fin uh, foreign finance to the NGOs, or at least asking NGOs yeah, that receive foreign finance not to take part in the political life and to register as foreign agents. And of course, there is a limitation of Russia today in Sputnik in the Western world, at least in some countries. Yeah, so it's, it's a certain competition for citizens, but also it's a disbelief in the maturity of citizens and in the maturity of the civil societies, uh, where the West and Russia are quite similar. And again, that's worrying. And there are similar concerns about security. It's probably more about external security on the part of Russia 
and my colleague, my co-panelist, uh, wonderfully demonstrated this uh, Russian concern about the expansion of the NATO and advancement of the NATO machine to the borders of Russia, as well as uh, a gradual phasing out of all arms, limitations, treaties. Yeah. But there is also, of course, a concern about the nexus between external and internal security in the Western part of the world and in the European Union in particular. And hence, because we have this vicious circle, we in fact come to a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way in terms of cooperation, but also in terms of mutual, mutual perceptions. Which brings me to the second part and to the bigger part of my presentation, because this was mostly about the summary of the debates or reconceptualization of the debates that we have in the literature and that we've had during these three days. But uh, what comes next? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk about two roads, yeah, two research avenues yeah, that we can take and which in fact have policy implications as well and that's something to consider at least because the state of affairs that we have is indeed worrying and I guess everybody agrees with that. So way out number one or step one. Yeah. So if we look at the contradictions between Russia and the European Union at the moment, yeah? uh, I think we actually have to adjust the argument that Russia challenges the liberal old world order by saying that Russia in fact exploits the contradictions that already exist in the liberal world order. Yeah? They are not new, yeah? they have been known for ages and Russia just makes use of them. Yeah? And some of them were in fact described by Sorensen very well by saying that it is a liberalism of imposition on the one hand and the liberalism of restraint on the other hand. Two contradictions yeah, uh, are worth mentioning in this respect. This is a contradiction of sovereignty on the one hand versus interference and responsibility to protect on the other hand. And the second one is about universality of values, of human rights, of democracy, of the rule of law, and of uh, uh, social values, uh, economic values, and then peculiarity, yeah, or country specificity that Russia insists upon. Yeah. If you look at the Valdai discussions, which you already mentioned today here, you will see that uh, most of the uh, Valdai fora yeah, of the recent years were exactly devoted to these two topics. Yeah. And again, they're not new. They have already been quite deeply researched uh, in the literature on liberalism and neoliberalism. The third contradiction, which is probably even more important for Russia, is a contradiction between uh, the US hegemony, yeah, which is a part of the governance structure of the liberal world order, on the one hand, and the liberal character of the regime, and the democratic character of the regime, uh, on the other hand. When Russia speaks about democracy and its foreign policy, it actually speaks not so much about internal democracy, it rather speaks about external, an external dimension of democracy saying that external democracy, international democracy is about uh, countries being equal and treated equally yeah? uh, uh, as opposed to a uh, uh, hegemonic world. Yeah? So uh, again, like this contradiction does exist in some literature on liberalism and basically just demonstrates that Russia does not challenge so much the liberal world order but rather exploits these contradictions. Yeah? Uh, what is more, and that has already been voiced in, these confer in this conference as well, Russia, in fact, uh, does not voice any meaningful alternative yeah, to this world order. Yeah. Russia challenges some of its provisions, but at the same time, it justifies its behavior with the very same provisions. Yeah. Okay, Russia speaks about conservative, a conservative set of values, but is it really a challenge, yeah? or rather an exploitation of the values that have already been reinterpreted? Yeah. Russia does uh, use uh, the uh, idea about strong leadership. Yeah, which uh, so many non-Russian players are in fact so sympathetic about, yeah, because threats are not predictable and therefore of course there is this natural desire to in fact rely on this strong personality who will sort out the issues as opposed to taking the responsibility for your own security and, uh, and for the dynamic and dangerous life of today. Yeah. But Russia does not voice a meaningful, a meaningful alternative to the liberal world order. And in fact, the very, the very idea that it tries to denote a difference between itself and the West, but not between itself and Asia and between itself and Africa, is also telling. Yeah? 
So uh, no alternative there. A lot of sort of like the idea of reinterpreting the world order to take into consideration Russian concerns. Why is it important to, in fact, shift the debate from the challenge of the liberal world order to exploiting the contradictions of the liberal world order? For at least four reasons. Yeah? One is that it opens uh, the space for the dialogue and for the mutual search for concessions and compromises, and that's important. Yeah? It opens, opens the space for negotiations. Secondly, the, the liberal world order, to be liberal, and to be global has to incorporate most of the stakeholders. And that includes Russia, that includes China, but that of course comes at a price. And the price is that these players have to take the responsibility for this liberal world order. Yeah? So it's not a one way street. Yeah? Uh, it's just like it should be balanced. Thirdly, uh, this recognition in fact opens a window of opportunity to cooperate on shared threats. And there are many shared threats. Uh, be it terrorism or global warming or proliferation, that has to be taken into account. Yeah? We do have common threats and they have to be dealt with. And lastly, uh, it opens a space for both Russia and the West uh, to face internal problems uh, and internal issues, and uh, both economic and political in the case of Russia. Yeah, there is no doubt about that. Right, so this is the first avenue to explore, but, that's, but the story doesn't end there. Because there's also a second avenue, yeah, which in fact uh, supplements the first one. And that's uh, about uh, uh, the phenomenon of resilience. Those of you who know more uh, about my research uh, have probably heard that I recently started uh, a big project on resilience, which in fact departed from the EU's global strategy on resilience. But I think it can be, the notion of resilience can actually be applied to EU-Russian relations as well. The notion of resilience can be applied to EU-Russian relations if you treat EU-Russian relations as a system with its own internal characteristics of which resilience might be one. Yeah? What is resilience? Yeah? One of the authors who writes about resilience, in fact, described it as the art of living dangerously. Yeah? So it's basically, it's uh, about uh, your capacity yeah, to live in a situation when threats are multiple, yeah, when you cannot eliminate the threats, but you can actually adjust to these threats and maintain your capacities or the capacities of a system to actually regenerate and fulfill its uh, uh, fulfill its uh, response, uh, fulfill its duties. Secondly, yeah, it's about the system, uh, about the, abit the ability of the system to bounce back, yeah, to maintain itself, yeah, and to adapt to the new threats and the new environment. It's also about a bottom-up approach. Yeah? In the situation, in the dialogue between the state and the society, it's about the society taking the responsibility and sort of like. Uh, adapting to the situation of different threats and different sort of like unpredictable situations, of which we have many in EU-Russian relations at the moment. Yeah. And of course, uh, if we adopt the notion of resilience and if we treat EU-Russian relations as a system, then it allows for the continuation of the debates on the liberal world order. It's kind of, it's a fallback option if you want. Yeah? So like the discussion on the liberal world order can continue while we still have relations. Resilience in the moment, at the moment, the way it is applied in the European Union is a bit different because it departs from the EU's normative vision and uh, it departs from a one-way sort of like emanation of the values. But the chair shows me that I don't have that much time, so I will skip that point because I would like to raise two more issues. Yeah. So if you speak about uh, resilience, uh, then the question of course is what uh, the resources of this resilience are in EU-Russian relations. And you know them all, yeah, and they have been uh, discussed, at least most of them have been discussed in this, in, in this conference. These are economic links, yeah? and in particular, uh, it's not just a simplistic trade of the 1970s when we just exchange gas for sausages, I guess that was the notion of the 1970s. Yeah, so it's about production cooperation, it's uh, about production chains. Secondly, yeah, research cooperation yeah, is very important, especially, yeah, I just like uh, put down the example of the space here because Russia is still, still 
in the driving chair in there, and uh, Russia can still contribute quite a lot there. There is infrastructure, be it transport or telecommunication, or information, or energy. But more importantly, it is about people-to-people -people contacts. Yeah. And there are many, yeah, ranging from tourism, through business, to NGO cooperation, research cooperation, epistemic communities dialogue, and of course, border, cross-border cooperation of all sorts. Yeah. And uh, of course, being in Finland, we have to talk about this cross-border cooperation. And cross-border cooperation is actually probably one of the very few fields that have not been substantially touched by the situation of today and by the crisis in the relations of today. And that, of course, uh, uh, brings us to the question of the governance techniques that we can apply to yeah, manage these resources. Yeah. And the first one that I would like to mention is mutual information flows. Yeah. Because we have to believe in the maturity of the society, we have to believe in the citizens, and in that sense, sort of like these information flows, uh, these information flows are essential you know, for both sides. We also have to think about smooth travel, you know, smooth human contacts. Uh, we know that visa-free uh, travel is, or well, negotiations on the visa-free travel is suspended. But since Russia talks so much about it, and if Russia is real about it, it can take the first step and try it asymmetrically. Yeah. And I would challenge Russian policymakers to do it asymmetrically. It's not exactly in the traditions of the Russian foreign policy, but why not? Thirdly, I would encourage both sides to think about the rule of law. And that's particularly, of course, the case uh, with Russia, yeah, where we still have to empower the judicial. Yeah. Not so much by the public pressure, but more by the societal pressure and by the pressure of the legal profession itself. Yeah. And we have to change uh, the situation yeah, from the well-known Russian notion that every law has a loophole. Yeah. I think the Russian way of saying it, Zakon Shtodishla, yeah, is actually more uh, telling than the uh, English translation of it. Yeah. But then I already mentioned that there was a very worrying tendency of talk about the spirit of law, not to apply the letter of law to the Russian cases. And I see this notion of spirit again and again in the West, yeah? be it the spirit of law, the spirit of Minsk, or the spirit of the WTO more recently, yeah? to justify why, why the Eurasian Economic Union, for example, is not recognized uh, by the European Union. Yeah? And I think it's worrying, yeah? because law has to be equally applied to all stakeholders, irrespective of whether they are Russian, yeah, in the situation where there is so much suspicion about Russia or Western. And of course, we have to gradually move to the phasing out of sectoral sanctions. I'm not talking about personal sanctions, but I'm talking about sectoral sanctions because they are detrimental to economic relations, and particularly to small and medium business in Russia, which is actually the pillar of a civil society. But that, of course, comes at a price of the implementation of the Minsk agreements and of at least freeze in the conflict in eastern Ukraine, which we all know about. So these are the two avenues that I suggest exploring, both in terms of research, but also in terms of policy implications, to in fact uh, make the relations between Russia and the West, and Russia and the European Union in particular, rebounds. And uh, it seems to be quite a challenging agenda, but I would rather stay sort of optimistic than pessimistic, and I would rather exploit opportunities than see opportunities as challenges. Thank you. Thank you.